Hello and welcome back to my channel. This will be the second of two vlogs I'm shooting today because I'm figuring just why not maximize my vlogging time for Sunday when there's not really much else to do today. Um, for the second vlog I'll be um, discussing and reviewing this book. It's called um, Emily of Deep Valley by Mart Maud Hart Lovelace. It's um, one of um, three books in the um, Deep Valley um, sort of spin-off series of the Betsy Tacy series which was written from the um, 40s until the 1950s. It's um, a very popular book series, though I don't believe it's particularly as well known as um, certain other famous classic book series, although it does um, have many fans. And this is also, I guess it would be classified as sort of like new adult, although I do have some issues with that um, age-based categorization, as I might be um, mentioning in a future blog. And so I, this is based on a blog post, which I did at the near the end of September, one of my last ones before um, I switched over to horror films, by the way, for um, Spooktober today. I'm wearing green lipstick from NYX and some um, purple glitter eyeshadow from NYX also. And I don't have um, any um, makeup brushes at the moment, so I had to um, put it on with my finger. So anyway, let's get on with the review. Well, I would still have to say my favorite of Maud Hart Lovelace's books is um, Carney's House Party, which I also will be reviewing in future. I have to give the nod to Emily Webster is my favorite of her characters. As a fellow introvert who wasn't part of the popular crowd and didn't come from a cushy bourgeois family, I can really relate to Emily. I also deeply relate to her as someone whose life hasn't unfolded on the same timetable as that of most of my peers. Emily Webster, who is um, based on Marguerite Marsh, who is a year older than Mrs. Lovelace but two years younger than her doppelganger Betsy, lost her mother in infancy and her father at two years old. Her grandparents stepped up to raise her, but her grandma died when Emily was ten years old. Now Emily lives alone on the edge of town with her grandpa Cyrus Webster, an 81-year-old Civil War vet. And this is like really something it like shows you how, you know, we're like more connected to the past than we realize. This book was um, set in um, like 1912 through 1913 by someone who was born in um, 1892, I believe. And like this woman has a, a Civil War vet grandfather and there are also a few other Civil War vet characters who appear throughout the book and like this was when Civil War vets were um, still alive and very much in living memory and they're referring to the um, Spanish American veterans as the young whippersnappers so you know today we think of like World War II and Korean vets as the really oldest veterans that we have and maybe like Vietnam or Desert Storm or like the young upstarts but you know in those days it was like completely different and they also were possibly some people were alive who had known veterans of the War of 18. 12 and some other wars so it's just this I love one of the reasons I love history it's this you know beautiful unbroken chain to the past because like we're connected to people who knew people or knew of people or heard stories from people and on and on and on so we're ultimately all you know connected into the past as long as world there has been so when Emily graduates high school in 1912 all her peers head off to college like for example the University of Minnesota Carleton College Vassar and a few local schools but because Grandpa Cyrus has no one else to take care of him, Emily is unable to pursue higher education. It's not even something she weighs the pros and cons of. Staying with Grandpa is just something she must do with that question. I know maybe a lot of modern people might not understand or relate to that, you know, that extreme, you know, sense of duty and loyalty and, you know, family coming first and not always being able to do whatever you want in school coming before all else just you know get a scholarship and go off and like get a caretaker for him that's just not in Emily's wheelhouse at all she just has to you know take care of grandpa because that's what good people do they step up for their family because Emily lives so far in the outskirts of town because she has so many heavy responsibilities she hasn't had the kind of cliche high school experience on Betsy did who obviously if you don't know Betsy is the title character and the main character of the main um, Betsy Tacy series, which was written by Maud Hart Lovelace. And Betsy does make appearances in all three of the um, spin-off Deep Valley books. She also makes an appearance in this book, although it's fairly minor compared to her appearances in the other two Deep Valley books. Though uh, Emily is frequently invited to come along to get-togethers and events, and does take up some of these offers throughout the book, it seems obvious she's invited more out of sympathy and obligation, and that she's always on the periphery of this crowd. You know, she's not the one hanging out and having fun and going to the soda shop at all hours. She like g does what she needs to do, put in an appearance for social sake or to appease her friends and cousin Annette, and then she'll just go back home to grandpa or to study or do whatever she wants. She's not, you know, some social popular butterfly like Betsy. Emily is very intelligent and serious though. 
she was the only girl on the acclaimed debate team, although it's kind of like a bit of a divergence from the um, Betsy Tacey series where there's a, a girl's debate team. So I don't know if that's like some kind of discontinuity error, Ms. Mrs. Um, Lovelace missed, or if there was just some kind of change at the school or there was Emily chose to be on the main debate team instead of joining the girls debate team. But anyway, that's just something I noticed about the book. Emily loves reading, history, and politics, and her dream is to become a social worker like her Shiro Jane Adams. Emily's graduation speech is about Ms. Adams, and this is kind of an interesting thing, like showing how teaching and learning was considered at the time. She has to memorize her graduation speech instead of reading it from a paper like the teacher who's like overseeing the graduation actually collects the papers of the students who are speaking so they don't, you know, read from their notes. God forbid they have to know it all by heart, and also in the um, Betsy Tacey series, Betsy also has to memorize her own graduation speech, so that's totally um, different from nowadays when many teachers don't even do memorization at all, or maybe at best a couple of short poems here and there, but it's no longer, you know, a fundamental building block. You know, you must memorize tons and tons of stuff in every single class, even your graduation speeches, and like do like recitals all the time in all, every class and for, um, speeches and, you know, um, tests and things like that. So it's just a much different world in many different ways. But Emily does have extended families. For example, her beautiful, sophisticated, glamorous second cousin, Annette, and Annette's parents, whom Emily calls Aunt Sophie and Uncle Chester, despite not being related to them that way. Aunt Sophie regularly has new clothes made for Emily by town dressmaker, Miss Mix, and has Emily and Grandpa over for holidays, and I believe a few other times on and off too, although they don't always, you know, like going over there because it sort of reminds them they're not that you know, privileged and don't have these wonderful things. That's just not the life they themselves had. Sometimes they beg off doing it because they want to get together with some of their new friends instead. And there's also a love interest, Don Walker, who was on the debate team with Emily. Over the summer, he regularly visits and discusses books. One time, he brings Emily a book of Robert Browning poetry, but it's obvious to everyone but Emily from the jump that Dawn isn't very sincere or nice, but although Emily does eventually figure out Dawn isn't the man for her and he's not such a great person at all, maybe it is possible she does like realize this deep down, but it just takes a while for her to you know, admit it to herself. Sometimes the heart and the mind are in disagreement about something and you just have to you know figure this out and admit it to yourself. Uh, obviously, this happens to many people in different relationships and love interests, so Emily isn't the only one who has to face this. Emily sinks into despondency when her erstwhile friends leave for college. They're all going places in their lives and having fun, while she's stuck in Deep Valley as Grandpa's full-time caretaker. At first, Emily tries to lift her spirits by attending a high school pep rally for a football game, but a comment from the new coach and who is also one of the teachers at the school. It's like a lightning bolt that wakes her up and makes her realize she's unhealthily clinging to the past and not moving forward into a new adult life. Instead of going to the game, she hurries home to put her hair up in a psyche knot, which was one of the more um, simple, like, bouffant, pompadour, um, Edwardian women's hairstyles, although I did watch a tutorial on YouTube for it, and it looked kind of complicated even for something similar. I can't really be bothered with complex hairstyles myself, so you know that did take a lot of you know time and commitment for women to wear their hair up all the time. I just do it in a bun or the Princess Leia style or braids or ponytails. I just can't be bothered. I'm just such a tomboy and don't care about hair. So Emily also gets some new hats to accommodate this change in hairstyle and a few new clothes because your um, hat would depend on what your hairstyle was. Certain hats couldn't be wear, like if you were wearing your hair up in a bouffant, there were a certain Hats that didn't work well with it at all or just didn't like look good or accommodate it. And like, likewise, if you're wearing your hair loose or in braids, there were other hats that you could wear that you couldn't wear if you were wearing a bouffant hairstyle. She like realizes, you know, you have to, you know, sometimes when you change the outside, the inside gradually starts to follow too. And also in that, you know, a lot of people don't realize this now because people tend to all basically like dress the same and do the same things and look the same. But in those days, there were lots of different things that are distinct, distinguished um, children and like teenagers from adults. For example, when a girl reached about 16, maybe a little younger or so, she would start um, wearing a corset, start wearing her hair up and wear ankle length skirts. And that was like part of the transition from girl to woman. And most um, girls looked forward to that. And also contrary to um, popular misconceptions, most women did not wear um, tight laced corsets. It was just like a base, basic um, foundational undergarment and was not supposed to be uncomfortable at all. That was just something 
you wore, just like, you know, wearing your hair up wasn't seen as, like, torture or boring or horrible. It was just something that, you know, adult women did to distinguish their new um, phase in life and make them look different from little girls and also, like, wearing long skirts. That was something they really looked forward to. Like, I, oh, I'm becoming a woman now. I'm no longer a little girl who wears short skirts and long, loose braids and, like, no corset. So after Emily starts changing her look, it's like a magic wave wand has been waved. Because she finally looks her age, Emily begins getting attention from a slightly older crowd who's still in town. And this um, slightly older crowd is only about two years older than she is, although obviously many people remember this feeling when you're 18, like even small age differences feel so magnified. So like when a, usually a girl gets like interested in an older man who's only like, you know, three, four years older when she's 18, it's like, oh, wow, this wonderful, like mature, sophisticated older man likes young 18 year old, like college fresh woman, me. And it's like, you know, in like, 10 years or so, like three, four age, your age difference is no big deal. But when you're all of 18, it feels like so like special when you have like someone who's a few years older than you who wants to be your genuine friend or go out on a date with you. It's just, you know, age differences feel so much larger when we're younger. And, and for the first time, Emily feels like she's found her tribe people with serious interests that match her own instead of the people her own age from high school only cared about having a fun, good time, and mindless socialization. One of her new friends, Cab Edwards, takes her out to several dances. And I, in this book, I found Cab much better developed than in the Betsy Tasty series because one of the issues I have with that series, although I re recognize it is, like, written very well and an interesting story, and I like, like, pretty much most of the characters, it's just because there's such a large ensemble cast, and particularly in starting in the high school books, they're just characters are just like thrown at us pretty thick and fast and so it's hard to tell who's whom particularly when they're not like particularly you know detailed and developed individually or in small pairs we're just supposed to remember oh who all these people are at once and like keep track of them even when they're not like major characters at all or even important secondary characters slowly but surely emily starts coming into her own and making lemonade out of the lemons life handed her she might not be a college girl, but there are so many other rewarding things she can do, like start a Browning discussion group, help the people in Little Syria, and resume music lessons. And by the way, the Little Syria, which appears throughout the Betsy Tacy and Deep Valley books, the people who lived there were actually Lebanese, but at the time, the, that area of the, the that country they came from was called Syria, and it was only later split into Syria and Lebanon, and these people unfortunately feast a lot of like z xenophobia and nativism and racism and discrimination, and Emily has to really go to the bat for them and stand up for them, and when these people are saying, oh, we should only, America for the real Americans, and we shouldn't let these people immigrate because they're not, you know, white and delights them or wasps, you know, so she has to, you know, stand up for herself and for her new friends and say they're just like us, they need our help with learning how to adjust to American life and we shouldn't discriminate against them and they should be our friends and we should, you know, accept them without question because they're just the same as us and don't, you know, have old, like, stupid prejudices. No, I really enjoyed watching Emily's gradual growth into a strong, confident woman who knows her own mind, how to find fulfillment and happiness. I can also her relate to her much more than Betsy, who does, as I mentioned, make a brief appearance that feels really shoehorned and it's almost, it feels like it's saying, oh, look, this character exists and we're referencing her and we're reminding you she exists but it, I really feel the book could have been as strong as it is without Betsy in there it just felt like kind of unnecessary just to like use her for the mere sake of using her because Emily was already on, well on her way to realizing sometimes you need to take a gap year and not go on to college necessarily and just like figure out who you really are and what you want to do in life and find your own interest without um, Betsy um, showing up. And Emily faces a lot of real challenges that aren't easily, quickly resolved. Like, Betsy does ha doesn't really have much, like, huge, heavy drama or serious problems. It's just basically, like, lightweight stuff that gets, like, resolved pretty quickly. And Emily isn't Miss Popularity. Boys aren't beating a path to her door. She doesn't have class privilege. It's like throughout the Betsy Tacy series, it's very, very obvious that Ray's, Betsy's family are upper middle class. Like, for example, her father can afford to send her off to Europe for a, like a grand tour to inspire her writing. And she can go, she and her um, older sister, Julia, are able to like go away to the Twin Cities to attend the University of Minnesota. And when Betsy gets appendicitis or freshman year of college, she's able to go to California to recuperate for a year at her grandma's house, even after she's better so like and they like live in a 
fairly large house they upgraded to after living in a somewhat small but still like obviously from the text like a lower middle class house there's just like so many things about Betsy's life are like very very bourgeois class privilege and Emily doesn't really have that she has to you know fight and work hard for things and she doesn't have like all these advantages that Betsy does and Emily is truly Ms. Lo Mrs. Lovelace's most mature complex character with a storyline to match and the story is a bit of a little bit of a slow burn it takes a while to develop it because it is more of you know character based than a plot driven and action centric. It's more about Emily's not really coming of age, but you know, just becoming an adult and learning how to stand on her own two feet and develop her own interest and realize when life takes an unexpected fork in the road, make the best of it and stand up and you'll like enter into a road you didn't realize was meant for you, but it's now perfect for you. And I really did enjoy this book and I would recommend it highly. And I also will be in future, I'm reviewing the um, Deep Valley spin-off books and the Betsy Tasty books. Also, I have one more book left to read in the Betsy Tasty series, um, Betsy's Wedding. And after that, I will have um, finally finished all the books in the series and can finish reviewing them on blog as well. So watch to the end. Thank you very much. Please consider subscribing. I review a lot of um, classic world literature, old books, and I'm also doing some author tube things. So please um, tune in um, again on Monday. I'll be discussing another book, possibly one of my um, Dante and posts. So see you very soon. Thanks. Bye.